Welcome to the Feeling Better Podcast. My name is Maria, and I'm the host of this podcast, former gambling addict and devoted Christian homesteading wife. I'm also the author of the Feeling Better 10-4 program that teaches you a practical, effective, inspirational 10-week program to help you overcome your compulsive gambling addiction, which you can listen to in the first 15 episodes of my podcast. Thanks so much for being here. First, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of the brave men and women who've served our nation. Yesterday was Veterans Day, and freedom is never free. Thank you to all of you who are current and former military for serving. I say a special prayer today for each and every one of you. God bless you and your families. Before I jump right in, I have a big announcement to share. I finally have my podcast content on YouTube. At first, I'd been laboriously creating videos from scratch using my audio files and then uploading them onto YouTube. It was so time-consuming that I only managed to get the first 15 episodes up. But then I had a chat with a fellow podcaster friend who told me about YouTube's new RSS feed for podcasts. What? Amazing! Now all I had to do was pop in my feed's URL and they ingested my podcast into the platform. So now, going forward, all my new episodes will go live on YouTube automatically. For some reason, if you're just looking at the channel, which is at The Feeling Better, the videos seem all out of order. But if you click on either the podcast link or the playlist, they're all in order there. So if you prefer to listen on YouTube rather than some other podcast platform, an easy way to find my channel is from my website, thefeelingbetter.com. I have a link to it there on the homepage. Because my YouTube channel is so new, it doesn't really come up when you do a search. Yet. But that will change, hopefully. So cross that one off my to-do list. Also, if you enjoy my podcast, please consider giving a five-star rating and review on your podcast platform of choice. That gets it in front of more people when they're searching for content that helps them with their spiritual battle or addiction. Huge thank you to those who've already done this. I have so much love for you all. And on that note, I have a major announcement I'll be sharing next week, so be sure to tune in. It's a biggie. In today's episode, I'm going to be reading from my new book, Imbalances, The Addict's Guide to Fixing Our Broken Lives. This week is Chapter 6, The Imbalance of Negative Thoughts. You know, I'm going to start this episode off with another celebrity of sorts. Is anyone out there familiar with who Kat Von D is? Kat Von D is a very talented, famous tattoo artist and musician who's known for her goth looks and dark artistry. I'll be honest, I only knew her from her makeup. Living out in the country like I have, my only makeup and skincare choices were whatever I could buy from the local Walmart or Rite Aid. Many years back, when I was more financially flush, I discovered Sephora. I began ordering some toiletries and makeup online through Sephora's website, which all got delivered right to my doorstep. My first and only real experience with Kat Von D was with her makeup. When you order from Sephora, you get samples with your order. I can't even remember what sample it was now, but one of them was from Kat's line of makeup, and I loved it. So, I bought other makeup products from her line, too. I really liked her mascara because, as a woman who's half Arab, I don't ever leave the house without mascara on. That's just something ingrained in my DNA. (laughs) And then I tried her concealer, and then her eyeliner, and before I knew it, I was a fan. But her makeup all came in packaging that was very vampire-looking. Like, if Dracula had a wife... That would be the makeup line she'd use. At the time, I had no idea who Kat was and didn't know she was a tattoo artist or anything. I just recall doing a Google search on her and seeing some blog post or article bio that said she was born in Mexico, had an alcohol problem, appeared on the TLC reality show LA Inc., and had a song titled Exorcisms. I also saw a few pictures of her. She's incredibly beautiful. Long, sleek black hair, full lips, flawless skin. She looked like an artistic blend of Cher and Morticia Adams. 
Being the Laura Ingalls Wilder nerdy version of a Christian homesteader, it just felt a bit unsettling to me, having makeup compacts and mascara tubes that were so vampirish and occult-looking. Sephora has many, many products on their website, so eventually, I just gravitated to other brands that wouldn't look so out of place in my Vera Bradley makeup bag. Disclosure, I do believe that since then she sold off her makeup line and is no longer involved in that piece of the business. So then, about a month ago, I happened to spot a short reel on YouTube of Kat getting baptized, which was utterly shocking and completely amazing. And in that clip, some unknown gal was commenting about how Christians should be ashamed of all the negativity and cruel comments that they were flinging at Kat. Well, what was that all about? I began clicking through to some links, and there I saw an incredible video of Kat Von D in a white robe, looking gorgeous and ethereal, getting baptized in the name of Jesus. Since then, I'd followed her story, fascinated and wildly in love with her testimony. She just this week appeared on the YouTube podcast show of Allie Beth Stuckey, sharing the story of her life and what led up to her baptism in faith in Christ. It was a pretty awesome interview. I'll put a link to it in the show notes of this episode if you care to watch it. But one of the things that emerged throughout this transitional experience for her that she mentions more than once are all the so-called Christians who bashed her in the comments of her baptism video, calling her fake, saying she was doing it as a PR stunt, insisting that if she was really a Christian, she wouldn't still be dressing in dark goth clothing and listening to The Cure. Man, that really broke my heart. Instead of the entire Christian community coming together and welcoming this woman into the family, offering her blessings and prayer on her new journey, celebrating the power of the Holy Spirit and her new salvation in Christ, they mocked her and belittled her? That made me feel so embarrassed for those of the Christian faith, and it just broke my heart. Because, as she said, others were reading those comments who might be searching, and understandably, they'd say they don't want any part of that vile, ugly cult of so-called Christians. Now, I'm sure some of those people were simply wolves in sheep's clothing, meaning not really Christians. One of the things scripture says repeatedly about the end times is for us to make sure that we're not deceived. Paul talks about this extensively in his letter to Timothy, from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-13. through You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times, for people will only love themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. They are the kind who work their way into people's homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following new teachings, but they're never able to understand the truth. These teachers oppose the truth, just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith, but they won't get away with this for long. Someday, everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as with Janus and Jambres. But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, but the Lord rescued me from all of it. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil people and impostors will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. So who were Janus and Jambres? Well, the Bible doesn't say, 
but Jewish tradition states that these were sorcerers, magicians who were with Moses who were able to use their dark arts to mimic the abilities that God gave to Moses, like turning his staff into a snake. It was said that they were followers of Moses who were part of his crowd and who were instrumental in nudging Aaron to construct the statue of the golden calf to worship. Anyway, this story is critical to the particular imbalance that I'm discussing here in this chapter, the imbalance of negative thoughts. Just like the imbalance of relationships, our thoughts can be imbalanced in a million different ways, all contributing to a wobbly, uncertain, unstable life that can make us prone to spiritual attack. But what I want to focus on today are those thoughts that are dark and ugly. Sometimes those thoughts can be about other people. Sometimes they can be about ourselves, and they really turn into a bigger problem when we voice those thoughts, either verbally or via our keyboard or in some other way. My mother was really into astrology when I was growing up. As I mentioned before, she had been born a Catholic and then got pregnant as a teenager who eventually married my Muslim father and gave that baby up for adoption. Then I was born. My mother had readily agreed to convert to Islam and raise us kids as Muslim, but clearly she hadn't been able to find any inner peace or guidance. She was always reading Jean Dixon books, who was famous for being a psychic and an astrologer. And she also made a practice of cutting out horoscopes or taping them up on the fridge or leaving them on the coffee table. I knew from a young age that I was a Virgo, having been born in September. For many, many years, my mother had a little personality outline of the Virgo child taped up on her mirror in the bedroom. I have no idea why she had mine up there and no one else's. Maybe because I was the more difficult child, or because I was her firstborn, well, firstborn in her union with my father. I still remember clearly some of the things it said, like, Virgos are rigid children who constantly strive for perfection. They're overly critical of others as well as themselves. They are worry warts and will worry about everything. Their minds are sharp and they're intelligent and they're organized, but they have a difficult time connecting emotionally and tend to see the world through a cold, objective lens. Oftentimes, their negative perceptions will manifest into chronic stress, which may present in the weakness of his or her stomach, such as ulcers or a frequent nausea. Many times in my life, I wondered what I would have been like had I not had that preconceived notion of myself right in front of my face whenever I walked by. I must have run that thing a thousand times. I'm sure my mother probably put it up as a reminder to her about who I was in order to help her deal with me or maybe to remember to be more compassionate when raising me. But for decades afterward, Right up until today, I still consider myself a stressed worrywart that strives for perfection and never achieves it, who has a weak stomach, hence my diverticulitis diagnosis after the fall of my gambling addiction, and who always believed that I had a difficult time connecting emotionally with people. Is that really me? My character traits that I was born with simply because I was brought into this world in a particular month? Or did I take those negative statements about me and replay them in my mind so frequently that I began believing them from a young age, accepting that this was the kind of person I was? I had mentioned in my last episode that after learning about my gambling addiction, my husband, once he got past the initial shock of it all, never belittled me or said a negative thing about me. He never made me feel badly about what I'd done to our finances and how I'd essentially ruined us for a long, long time. He could have easily thrown insults at me, held it over my head, never let me forget it. But he didn't do any of those things, and thank God, because his disapproval, or any mocking insults, or any doubt or mistrust or self-righteousness from him would have absolutely broken my heart. Not to mention my spirit, and it would have made it so much harder to get past the guilt and the shame. I honestly don't know if I could have overcome my addiction if I had been burdened by negative thoughts and words that came from the man who was supposed to love me. Instead, though, he showered me with support, 
with encouragement and with trust and faith in my purpose, with the understanding that everyone is flawed and we're all human. He is undoubtedly my rock, and without him, I wouldn't be in this place of victory and strength that I am today. I wish that I could take every single person who made a negative comment on Kat Von D's baptism video and sit them down in front of me to ask them what they honestly think Jesus would feel about them tearing down someone whose new seed of faith is starting to grow and flourish. Do they even realize the kind of damage they could do? And I'm not speaking about the people who may have pretended to be Christians, the wolves in sheep's clothing. I'm talking about the real Christians. I think about what kind of mother or wife or sister or daughter that person might be in real life. I knew a gal like that once. She wasn't a Christian. She was a colleague of mine many years ago back when I worked in an office. Our small sales team of 10 people were almost all Christian. Even our boss was a Christian. It was mostly because of that team that I came to know and love Jesus Christ. Seven of them and eventually eight with me, were Christ believers. But this gal, I'll call her Paula, was not a Christian. She was nice enough and good at her job as a sales rep, but Paula was a negative Nelly. You know the kind. She found fault in everything. Her pizza was too undercooked. The day was too warm. The air conditioning too cold. The coffee too bitter. The customer was too grumpy. The sale was taking too long. On and on and on. She must have said the words, I hate, about two dozen times a day, every day. And I rarely heard the words, I love or I like, come from her. Well, unless she was saying it in a sarcastic kind of way, something like, I love it when I'm at a store and a pushy salesperson comes up to me and hovers around nearby. Or, I love it when the cashier's too stupid to count change back to me and they have to use a calculator. That was something I learned in fourth grade. I laugh every time. Or whatever. But it was mostly a vomit of negativity all day long. I hate this weather. I hate avocados. I hate when people sing off key. I hate reality shows. Ugh, it really started to grate on me. Sure, we all have things that we dislike, maybe even hate in life. But hearing that word repeatedly throughout the day subtly nudged us all to focus on the things that we hated rather than the things we loved or liked. One person's negativity far overpowered all the positive things other people shared, which was both fascinating and disturbing. I tried a few times to get together with her outside of work, to get to know her and maybe share some of my new Christian light with her, intending to be Miss Positive Pollyanna, hoping to rub off on her. But it did no good. I eventually stopped getting together with her because it was just so draining. Speaking of the word vampire, this gal was an emotional vampire. She just sucked all the life out of you. My Christian boss at the time also attempted to get her to shift her mindset. He began feeding us little nuggets of the concept, like attracts like. Now, I'm not talking about things like the book, The Secret or manifesting prosperity and blessing from your own supposed higher power. He simply taught us the understanding that what you think about is what you bring about. If you speak positive, encouraging things, and you uplift people with positive, encouraging words, then you yourself will feel more positive and encouraged. One of the things that Kat Von D talks about in her interview is that her faith hasn't changed her taste in music, art, or fashion, etc., But she did talk about how she threw away her books on spiritualism, occult practices, and other dark matters. She did that because she didn't want that stuff in her life anymore. The reality is, each of us are individuals. Some of us are so strong in our faith, in our own character, that we're impervious in our spirit to those things that are dark. For some, it may only be those obvious dark things like witchcraft, occult, horror movies, or other outwardly evil subjects. But for others, we may be more sensitive to things that open doors for demonic pressure and influence. I, for one, especially since my spiritual attack of gambling addiction, can't handle anything dark. I don't watch anything that even remotely resembles a horror movie or any stories about ghosts or goth topics. 
I just, by nature, stopped listening to all secular music because I was too vulnerable and fragile to any suggestions of negative thoughts or depressing themes. I used to be a huge fan of audiobooks of all genres, especially historical fiction, but I struggled listening to anything outside of Christian content lately. That doesn't mean I'm righteous or believe others should do the same. All it means, for me, is that I need to keep all my thoughts on the things of God, on the things above, as much as possible. Because if I don't, I feel little pinpricks, little holes, penetrating the fortress of spiritual identity and protection that I've enveloped myself in over the last several months. In order for me to keep the faith, so to speak, I have to feed my light wolf constantly. If I don't, if I starve it even a little bit, then the dark wolf inside begins to grow stronger. There might be some people whose light wolf is so strong and dominant, meaning their faith and spiritual character is so impenetrable that they don't even concern themselves with any of that stuff. They're able to live and exist and interact in a secular world without the worry or fear of the enemy. But not all of us are like that, and it's not something we can tell about other people. We don't know their level of sensitivity towards negativity, darkness, or bleak, gloomy things, or words of hate. Like, I once had a friend who loved cloudy days. She said they were cozy and relaxing and felt like a blanket of protection from God over the earth. I was enthralled with that idea, because I was always someone who needed light and sunshine. We all have our own ways of responding to stimuli, and what one person thinks is benign or innocent might be something that totally weighs down someone else. Over the years, and especially this past year, I've worked really hard to stay positive, to focus on the holiness of God and His plan for me, and staying close to His light. I fight the description of my Virgo horoscope every day, trying not to be such a perfectionist, trying to embrace contentment in all things, not allowing criticism to dominate my thoughts, whether they're about myself or other people. It's a constant effort, sure, but the results of that effort are tangible. They're real. My former boss was totally right. Like attracts like. When I focus more on good things, I feel good, and I see good all around me. When I focus more on negative things, I feel negative and I only see negative things around me. Here's a perfect example of what I mean. So you all know that I've been out of work and every week I put in applications and submit my resume for job postings I find online that fit my experience and background. At this point, I'm almost desperate for work. I had a job interview last week with what felt like a good company. The initial screening call with the HR gal was so good. No red flags, awesome discussion, and we got along really well. The role and job description seemed like an ideal fit, so she scheduled a Zoom call with the hiring manager for me a few days later. And that call went really well, too. It's good money, excellent benefits, and while not exactly the ideal perfect job that I'm looking for, it's pretty close. My skills and experience were an ideal match for the kind of sales executive they were looking for, and the manager's last words to me were, Great, your resume is impressive, and I think you're going to be a terrific fit. I have one more step for you, and I'd like you to meet with two members of our upper management, both people that I trust implicitly. You three can have a discussion about our culture, our company, and your fit for this role. I'll get in touch with them now, and we'll see if we can get that last round of the interview process on the schedule this week. I, of course, was beyond thrilled. So, after that meeting, I sent a thank you email and reiterated some of my career achievements and expressed my eager enthusiasm for the next Zoom call. And then I waited, and waited, and waited, and waited. I heard nothing back. The week ended and the weekend came around. My husband and I prayed on it and I had others praying for us too. And when Monday came and still nothing, I began to get frustrated. What kind of manager does that? 
How do you tell someone they're going on to the next round of the interview and then let four or five business days go by without any communication? I know it's becoming more common practice these days for companies to ghost their applicants, but after two rounds of an interview, I just felt like it was so unprofessional. I couldn't understand where things went wrong. I sent a nice follow-up email expressing my continued interest and still got nothing. I began to rant. What is wrong with people? What's wrong with me? Why can't I land a job? Is God ever going to bless me? Am I still being punished? How long am I going to struggle and suffer? I'm so exhausted and so weary and so tired of juggling bills and not having money. I can't take it anymore. I just need to earn some income. My husband looked at me and shook his head at all my wailing and lamenting. Come on, honey, where's your faith? How can you give up so easily? Why aren't you trusting God? You're the one always saying he provides for us and takes care of us. Just relax and stay positive. It's all going to work out. I know it's taxing you mentally, but you can't let it. You have to remember that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him. Stop with the negativity. You're going to drag yourself down. Instead, let God lift you up. And don't make it harder on yourself by thinking about the worst case scenario. What he was referring to is the famous line of scripture that Paul writes in Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I knew what he was saying, of course. I understood all of that. But it was easier to be negative and to bash the whole situation and beat myself up and think about the worst case scenario, that I didn't get the job and they were ghosting me rather than keeping the faith and holding on to the promises of God. Sure enough, that very next morning, I had an email from the HR gal who apologized for the delay, saying that everyone was tied up in their schedule with the board meeting that went longer than it should have and was way more intensive than they anticipated, but I'd be hearing from them that day. And of course, later on, I got an email inviting me to that next round of the interview process. Folks, It's so much easier to let our thoughts drift to the negative. And it's so much easier for our words to speak out harshly with skepticism. Yet many of us don't even realize how damaging this is for our mental health or how damaging it can be to others. I've lived almost 50 years and I've seen the serious consequences of impulsive, negative, judgmental words. Some of those have come from my own mouth. I still have vivid memories of times that I said things to people that I wish I hadn't, because I know they left their mark, scars that will be forever remembered. There is so much hate in the world today. So much of it. People in society right now are so quick to spew ugly, hateful words that condemn, judge, ridicule, and demean others in their own self-righteousness. Let me state this emphatically. That kind of talk should never, ever come from a Christian. I understand mistakes happen. Sometimes things just fly out of our mouths, or we think things about others without even realizing it or giving consideration to it ahead of time. We're humans, and humans are ridiculously flawed, sinful creatures. But we should always make an effort to control our tongues. James, the half-brother of Jesus, talked a lot about this. In James chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. He goes into the subject matter much deeper in chapter 3. The first 12 verses are in a section actually called Taming the Tongue. Allow me to read. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Instead, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses it to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, The tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. 
but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It's restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who've been made in the image of God. And so, blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Back in the time of Jesus, people didn't have keyboards, laptops, and phones. Otherwise, if they did, I'm quite sure James would talk about the ways our tongue speaks evil via the words that we type out on our keyboards. It's so easy these days for people to throw out ugly comments. I've mentioned before that most of the media I consume is from YouTube, and I've seen some seriously vile comments from followers on YouTube. Not just trolls, but presumably everyday people who watch and follow. Facebook and Instagram were the same way. You know, my grandmother used to say something that no one says anymore these days. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Because when you speak negatively about someone, you just have no idea the repercussions that could inflict. Kat Von D even shared how her husband is on his own journey, attending church with her, but still asking questions and trying to find his own answers. I totally understand that. The Holy Spirit did that to me when I was on the cusp of getting saved. I had all kinds of questions, and I looked up answers and articles and asked people what they thought about things and watched videos, reading commentary on all kinds of conflicting thoughts that I had in my head. Jesus was knocking, but I wasn't quite ready to answer. Kat said in her interview that when her husband saw all the ugly things that Christians were saying in comment to her video, he was disgusted and turned off by it stating that he didn't want to be part of that. Trust me, you don't want to be one of those that causes other believers or future believers to stumble. Even worse than the ramifications it's going to potentially have on them, it's also extremely damaging to you. When Jesus gave his sermon on the mount, he taught many things, and he told the people that when you have hate in your heart towards someone, it's just as bad as killing them. Both sins are equal in their weight to a Christian believer. In Matthew 5, verses 21 and 22, Jesus says, You have heard that our ancestors were told, You must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say, even if you're angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. In other words, Jesus is saying, you think you're all righteous because you're obeying the command, you shall not murder, but anger, hate, and murderous rage all come from the same place, that dark wolf inside you. Satan loves it when humanity gets all vile and outspoken in anger and hate. Are we sowing seeds of unity, love, and joyous faith as light of the earth when we say nasty things? Or are we sowing seeds of division and evil? When someone says ugly things, they have one goal in mind, to make that person feel bad. I honestly don't understand that. I'm not saying that I haven't said ugly things in my life. I'm not innocent in that regard. But it was always something that I said impulsively and immediately regretted and felt badly about. Or I didn't understand because I had been too immature. Here's another one of those stories of mine that has haunted me for many, many years. When I was a young whippersnapper of about 24 or 25, I worked in an office as a customer service gal. There were about 15 of us all together in that office. One girl, who I'll call Mandy, was a couple of years younger than me and also worked there. 
She was funny and sweet and vulnerable, and I thought she was beautiful. She had long, dark hair and big doe eyes and a dazzling smile. Over time, having cubicles right next to each other, we'd become really great friends. We began spending a lot of time with each other outside of work, and I'd come to know her and love her as a true friend, someone that was in my inner circle. We went to concerts together and did a lot of shopping and hung out at each other's houses. We'd often sit for hours listening to music and just chatting. We had a lot of fun, and we got along really well with everyone else in the office. It was honestly a great time in my life, and Mandy had quickly become one of my very best friends. As two young, immature girls, we had terrific imaginations. We'd often imagine what our kids would be like, what our ideal homes would be like, what we'd do in our careers, or where we would travel. We understandably talked a lot about work when we were alone together, and at one point, we even made up fictional character names for all the others who worked with us in the office. And some of those names were admittedly not very nice. They were silly and harmless on our part, but yeah, some of them were based on unflattering looks or negative caricatures of personalities that could have been harmful, possibly even perceived as cruel if the coworkers ever got wind of those names we gave them. But Mandy and I kept it totally between ourselves. At the time, I had a serious boyfriend and had a wonderful relationship with his family. I'd often go up north with them to their summer cottage on a river and had a blast swimming, boating, barbecuing, and enjoying bonfires. Every weekend, my boyfriend and I went up north in the summer, and often we'd bring up various groups of friends. A couple of times, Mandy came with us. But one time in the summer of the year 2001, my boyfriend and I went up north to the cottage for a week-long vacation. Mandy was more than happy to take on my duties at work while I was away from the office. Back then, cell phones hadn't really become commonplace. None of us had one, so we couldn't easily text or email to check in like nowadays. It was awesome, though, because back then, no one expected you to stay connected or in touch while you were on vacation. Ah, uh, yeah, those were the good old days. But back in the office, each of us did have our own desk phones with voicemail, with our own personal greetings and personal passcodes that we could check throughout the day. You know, responding back to customers' questions and order inquiries. While I was about halfway through my vacation week, I called Mandy one evening and left her a long voicemail message on her personal phone line, knowing that she'd get it the next morning. I asked how everyone was doing and how things were going at the office, prattling on about various things, making references to some of our coworkers using those secret names that we had for them. I didn't expect any kind of callback from her, of course. It was just me checking in to say hi and to thank her for covering for me while I was out, letting her know that I hadn't forgotten about her while I was away. When I got back to work the following Monday, it was clear that something was very, very wrong. The entire office felt like a funeral. No one was talking. Gone was the typical lighthearted joking and banter that we usually all enjoyed. Every single one of my coworkers had withdrawn into themselves, and I had no idea why. I thought something really bad had happened while I was gone, but no one told me anything despite all my questions. It was super unnerving. Even Mandy wouldn't say much to me, even when I pulled her aside. I kept asking what was wrong, what the problem was, and no one told me a thing. Feeling peculiar and uneasy, I just tucked myself away in my cubicle and busied myself with all the work that I needed to catch up on. When my manager, who'd had that Monday morning off, came in around noon, she finally called me into a conference room and sat me down next to her. The owner of the company, a man who was good, fair, respectable, and that we all liked, also walked in and sat down with us at the table. I thought I was getting laid off or something, that the company was going through tough financial times and was letting people go. But that wasn't it. They both proceeded to explain to me that somehow, my voicemail message to Mandy ended up on everyone's voicemail system.
Every single person in the entire company had heard it, not just Mandy. I was stunned. That was definitely not what I was expecting to hear. I was obviously confused, upset, and recalling bits of what I'd said and the names I used for people, I felt unbelievably ashamed and embarrassed. How did that even happen? I broke down crying, apologizing, insisting it was harmless, but I knew that several of my coworkers were hurt by the unkind names that I'd used in my message. My manager told me that some people were finding it really hard to believe that those words came from me because I was so likable, nice, and genuine. But there was no mistaking my voice or the message I'd left. The owner of the company admitted that he didn't see how that could happen from an outside phone call, but he'd get to the bottom of it because he wasn't liking the situation at all. A couple of days later, the owner called Mandy and me into his office. And what he told us shocked me. He said something like, I know everyone has been really upset by Maria's words and that people are hurt and very concerned by the things she said, but I'm more concerned about a bigger problem here. We're a small company and I've got many more important things on my plate than to play detective or counselor, but I care about you both and I'm deeply perturbed by my discoveries. I had a local technician for our phone system come in and diagnose the situation. I had a suspicion, but I wanted to confirm the facts with a professional before bringing this to light. Now, I'm not excusing Maria's words and what she did or their impact to my other employees, but it's clear that this was not intended for the public to hear. There is no possible way, whatsoever, that Maria accidentally left this message for everyone. That voicemail message was forwarded on as a broadcast to the whole company, and the technician was able to trace the activity back to you, Mandy. The only single way, with 100% proof positive, that this occurred is by you purposely forwarding Maria's message as a broadcast message to the entire company. He had a timestamp that this happened at 8.55 in the morning, not in the evening when Maria left her original message. I gasped, turning to look at Mandy in horror. I couldn't even comprehend that. At first, she tried to deny it, profusely insisting that she didn't do that. But after only a few minutes of the owner shaking his head, looking at her in disappointment for her futile attempts at lying, she finally broke down and confessed. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't help it, she said through her tears. And both the owner and I looked at her in confusion, unable to understand her motives. Why? he finally asked her, voicing the question that I couldn't seem to ask myself. Why on earth would you do such a thing? Don't you realize how many people you've hurt, including Maria? Mandy turned and shot me an angry look, with venom in her words. Because, because you... You're so perfect with your perfect little boyfriend and his perfect little family, and your life is so great. You get to go on vacation up north to that perfect little cottage and have a great time while I'm here doing the work of two people and not getting any recognition for anything that I do. My life is messed up, and nothing ever goes right for me, and I'm always struggling with things, and I just wanted you to know what it was like to be me for a while, a messed up person that people look down on. I had to knock you down off your high horse. Sometimes I just can't help but to hate you and to hate your perfect little life. Oh, wow. I could not believe how bitter and spiteful her words were. Upon hearing that, I blinked back my own tears, stung with the shock of her statement, utterly and completely horrified at the things that she was saying to me. The company's owner was clearly shocked too. I could see the sadness and pity on his face for me. This was my best friend. I'd never before seen any kind of hint of malice or ugliness toward me. I had no idea what to even say. I had always adored Mandy. Most people did. She was funny, sweet, smart, and beautiful. I knew she had self-esteem and confidence issues that stemmed from a broken home life as a child, but I honestly didn't think it was anything worse or different than my own broken childhood issues. If I in any way came off as being better than her, 
I certainly never intended it or felt that way. In fact, I truly leaned toward the opposite, minimizing my life and what I had because I was a gal who didn't like being in the spotlight in any way. I was always a better listener than talker, and I honestly thought that I had been a good friend to Mandy. And my boyfriend, or rather my relationship with him, was far from perfect. He'd been my first real boyfriend, and our relationship was young, insecure, immature, and volatile, and we were always fighting about one thing or another. None of Mandy's words made any sense. I just sat there, unable to say anything to her in response. I couldn't believe that someone I trusted and adored just stabbed me in the back like that. I recall the owner had pulled Mandy off to the side, offering gentle suggestions for counseling or recommending she take some time off herself to regroup. But I was just numb to it all. Remember, friends, I'd come from a very sheltered Muslim family life where I wasn't able to interact much with people or have many friends. I left home at 19, so I'd only had a handful of years in my real life away from my previous sheltered life at that point. It was a lot like the Amish people who leave their sequestered life to go live out in the real world. I was still incredibly naive, and I had been so seriously rattled by the whole incident. I had thought to myself, wow, if this is how my friends are going to treat me, what are my enemies going to be like? The ending to that story wasn't a good one. Mandy attempted a few times to apologize to me on the phone, insisting that she had mental health problems and she hadn't been taking her antidepressant medication as she should have. I forgave her and I accepted her apology, but I just didn't have it in me to let her back into my life. I just couldn't. I didn't harbor any resentment or anger, but I was very, very cautious from that point on about having any close friends. There was like a four or five year period that I didn't have any close friends, to be honest. I hung out with my boyfriend's friends and their girlfriends, but I shied away from any close connections for fear of something like that happening again. Mandy ended up quitting shortly after that whole situation, and I found it difficult to enjoy my work there anymore. Everyone was polite but they remained cold and detached toward me, and nothing I could do would erase any of it from their minds. The dot-com bubble arrived in full fury in the wake of 9-11, and the owner of the company had lost a lot of money in the stock market. In the aftermath of that economic event, the owner laid me off permanently, completely dissolving my position. There were other employees that were newer than I, or who did less work than I, or that would have been a more sensible choice to lay off instead of me. But I understood why he chose me. It was more than just a business decision. He had to do it for the benefit of his other workers and the overall culture and mental health of the remainder of the company. Of course, I learned a hard lesson from that story. It has been 25 years since that happened, and it's as fresh in my memory as if it happened yesterday. Don't talk behind people's backs. Don't say things about people that you wouldn't want them to hear. I realized after that point that those names weren't just harmless fun. I wouldn't want others talking behind my back or saying things about me in a mocking way. To this day, I always try to check myself when it comes to talking about another person. I can't stand gossip. And I do my best to ensure that whatever I'm saying about another person especially if it has any negative connotation at all, that I would feel comfortable saying it to them or in front of them, or I ensure that I'm simply stating facts, not personal observations. For example, I've talked about some of the character traits my husband has here on this podcast. He's heard it and totally understands it. I wasn't being mean or gossiping about him. It's nothing that he hasn't said himself or that we haven't talked about together or in front of other people. He describes himself in the same way with those same character traits, accepting that good-naturedly as part of his flawed human character. There's zero malice or hurtful intentions on my part when I talk about some of the challenges that I have with him. I'm simply using him because he's the biggest influence in my life 
to showcase various points and themes to help teach you all. And in the end, my love for him far outweighs any character flaws that he might have. Believe me, I know I have my own share. King David often talked about the people who hated him. In Psalm 41, he says this from verses 1 through 9. Oh, the joys of those who are kind to the poor. The Lord rescues them when they are in trouble. The Lord protects them and keeps them alive. He gives them prosperity in the land and rescues them from their enemies. The Lord nurses them when they are sick and restores them to health. O oh Lord, I prayed, have mercy on me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. But my enemies say nothing but evil about me. How soon will he die and be forgotten? They ask. They visit me as if they were my friends, but all the while they gather gossip, and when they leave, they spread it everywhere. All who hate me whisper about me, imagining the worst. He has some fatal disease, they say. He will never get out of that bed. Even my best friend, the one I trusted completely, the one who shared my food, has turned against me. So, folks, why is this one an imbalance? What does this have to do with spiritual attack and standing right with God? I think it's pretty obvious. Jesus told us, as I mentioned in my last episode, to be salt of the earth, preserve his message of salvation, and help keep wickedness and evil from rotting society. When we speak harsh words of judgment, hate, anger, or self-righteousness, condemning others, purposely and intentionally trying to harm them, that's no different in God's eyes than murder. You alter people's lives, you crush their trust and their confidence, and you dim their light and tamp down the power and message of a Christ believer. In other words, you quench the Holy Spirit and you feed the dark wolf, meaning you feed the spirit of darkness and evil. Those people who do this kind of thing without remorse, without apology, without repentance and making things right, they are not of Christ. Understand this, peeps. They may wear a cross around their neck and go to church and pray prayers or quote scripture, but if they intentionally spew ugly words and judgment, anger, and hostility, and don't immediately recognize what a jerk they were being and apologize for it, they are not Christian believers. They, too, are wolves in sheep's clothing, and not light wolves, but ugly dark ones that are sided with the enemy in opposition to God. Allow me to close with a reminder of the fruits of the Spirit from Paul in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16-26. through 26. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants you to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you're not under obligation to the law of Moses. Allow me to pause for a moment here. What Paul is saying is that now that we're Christian believers with the Holy Spirit, we won't be judged by whether or not we obeyed the Ten Commandments, but rather we are, by our new nature, held to a higher standard, just like Jesus explained in the Sermon on the Mount. Paul goes on to say, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and the desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. 
since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. I think that's pretty transparent, right? When you have hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, dissension, division, and selfish ambition, amongst other things, they come from the sin inside us, the dark wolf, which Satan and his demons love. Those things are in opposition to God and do not come from his spirit. Again, let's go back to like attracts like. You throw out there dark evil thoughts with dark evil words with dark evil motives that do not come from God, you will only attract more evil and darkness into your life. That all feeds the dark wolf so it grows bigger and stronger. If you don't make an effort to correct that, change that, and rectify that, it's going to result in spiritual demonic attack that's going to take you down in some form or fashion. Let me reiterate that this also pertains to thoughts about ourselves and our own situations in our own life, which again, more often than not, was my downfall. I tend to make an effort to be kind and genuine and loving toward all other people, but find it much harder to be kind and genuine and loving toward myself. It's like that situation with me this week with my interview. I went straight to, what's wrong with me? Why can't I get this? What am I doing wrong? Why am I such an idiot? Be kind to each other, folks. Be kind to yourselves. One of my favorite examples of a kind-hearted person was that of Boaz in the Book of Ruth. Pastor Craig Rochelle from Life Church recently did a fantastic six-part series on the Book of Ruth, a Moabite woman who stopped worshiping false idols and instead began to worship the one true God, and who went to Jerusalem with her mother-in-law, Naomi, after they both became widows. And there was this dude named Boaz who was really kind to her. He fed her, protected her, and took care of her, and eventually married her. Later, when they would go on to have kids, they would have a descendant named Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah of the world, Pastor Craig explains all the different ways this guy could have been a jerk or turned away from Ruth and Naomi or judged them by some of the bad decisions the two women had made. But he didn't. Because he was kind and generous and forgiving, he was blessed with a beautiful marriage and an even more beautiful lineage, playing his part as an ancestor of Jesus Christ. We just never know the butterfly effect of our words and actions. Negative words can have a long-lasting, harmful effect on someone, perhaps even lasting generations. But positive words and kind actions can also have a positive effect. Imagine if Kat Fondi's husband saw nothing but comments that were encouraging, kind, uplifting, and welcoming in their statements of praise and blessing for this young woman and her choice to follow Jesus instead of all those snarky, suspicious comments of judgment and condemnation. You don't want to be the one that faces Jesus at the end of your life, head held in shame while he asks you, like my boss did to Mandy, why on earth would you do and say such a thing? Don't you realize how many people you've hurt? I have no idea where Mandy is now, but I hope she's living a good life. I heard a few years after she quit that company that she moved out of state, struggling with mental health and unable to find her place in life. That made me sad, and I felt compassion for the poor girl. There are a lot of people like her in this world. They feel broken, unworthy, envious, and have low self-esteem, and they feel alone, like no one understands them. Maybe that someone is you, and perhaps it does make you feel a bit better for a fleeting moment to tear someone down or mock them or make fun of that person so that they too can feel the kind of discontent and dissatisfaction that you're feeling. It's almost the norm these days for people to lift themselves up by tearing someone else down. But that's not how God calls us to live. I promise you, you're missing out on the amazing feeling that makes you glow a hundred times brighter when you lift someone up and encourage them. It's kind of like 
taking your money and paying off a few credit cards instead of making the choice to gamble. Yeah, for a fleeting moment or two, it might feel really good to gamble, but afterward, you feel like utter crap. Being mean and ugly with your words and hate is a lot like that. Satan and his demons love to convince people that it's the right thing to do and the right way to feel and that it's good to make others feel badly about themselves. Remember, he's the father of lies and there is no truth in him. Trust in what Jesus says and what Paul and James reinforce. Love others and keep your thoughts positive. Focus on the good things like kindness and gentleness and encouraging people. Always. If they aren't doing something right, or you think that they need to be corrected or judged, let God take care of that. He didn't appoint you or me to be that person's judge or teacher or condemner. Remember last week's episode? Judge others and you too will be judged. My advice for Kat Von D or her husband, or anyone else who finds themselves a bit shaken by ugly Christians who allow hateful words and vile comments to come out of their mouths or their fingertips, just remember, not everyone who says they're a Christian is a Christian. There are a lot of fake people in the world today who identify as something or pretend to be something when they really aren't. Jesus shares with us a little secret about how to tell these imposters from the real thing. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, he says this, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but who are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Are you a branch of God's tree that produces good fruit, or is your fruit shriveled, bitter, sour, and full of rot and decay? You may be able to fool some humans, but you cannot fool God, nor can you fool Satan. Stay sweet, and you'll thrive under the shade and protection of God's tree, with all his other beautiful fruit. God bless you all, stay safe, and I'll see you next Sunday when I read Chapter 7, The Imbalance of Trust and Intimacy. Like holy water, like sand. It's all over now When daylight comes Over the long night Open your eyes It's all